question has been asked me uh, of whether it is uh, proper to give the interviewee some feedback in regard to was the last response correct or not. Uh, and um, uh, to give that feedback could um, change the, the outcome of the test, and in fact it probably could. I have felt comfortable in doing that as long as I do it for all patients so that the standardization of the score is um, going to be there. The um, uh, patient who uh, scored MCI, uh, I'm sorry, scored at the bottom end of normal, uh, actually, if I had given his clock drawing test uh, w one less point, he would have fallen into the MCI. And you'll see that from time to time. You'll be in a gray zone. So you can't get crazy about these categories. The fact that he was sort of hovering between the bottom end of normal and the top end of, of minimum cognitive impairment told me that I still had a problem, potential problem for this guy, and that he needed to be retested in six months. So um, uh, we don't have to think of these as being so critical or so uh, finite as that. I would rather have them viewed in a, in a more um, uh, artistic way, so to speak, uh, with, a, with a little bit of, put a little bit of judgment into this. You'll notice that on each of the cases where the, the individuals um, did not remember spontaneously one of the five objects, that I gave them cues. I mentioned, as I did that, that that's not part of the test. And so when they respond and get an answer after cueing, you don't give them that answer. You don't give them partial credit, like your high school English teacher did. They've, they've failed. Uh, to, to remember that spontaneously. But on the side, you remember, whoa, when I gave this guy cues, he got them all. Or when I gave him cues, he didn't get them all. Those people who are able to, uh, to remember after cueing, it may be a clue for the examiner that the etiology of the memory problem is from vascular uh, disease, something like multiple small stroke syndrome, uh, sentinel infarct syndrome, and so forth. If we turn to the geriatric depression scale, this is a yes-no uh, scale. And there is a much longer version of this with, uh, gee whiz, 30 questions or something. But there's no difference in the validity, the utility of the short form and the long form. So it's certainly worthwhile to use the short form. You don't gain anything by spending more time or, or wasting the patient's time, either one. Uh, if a person has a score of five or above, this indicates probable depression. Below five, probably not depressed. Now again, you need to use a little judgment, and if there are extenuating circumstances, things about the history that you know and they scored a four, you might uh, still want to um, make the hypothesis that depression existed. Similarly, if you use this um, test to follow up your treatment of depression, and the person used to score eight, and then after treatment they score four, that's sure better, but it isn't totally better, and you might consider this person to be a brick or two short of a full load of treatment, and you might want to increase your dose. Whereas if that person came back and scored a one or a two, you might be satisfied and not increase the dosage. I've been given a very good question here. Uh, how do we use these tests clinically uh, in working with families, and how do we uh, sort of uh, uh, stand back and get the 10,000 foot view of this. Uh, many families are oblivious to their loved one's um, uh, problems, and many are in denial. Uh, oftentimes, the spouse is also elderly, may have their own cognitive or depression problems, and therefore be in denial. First thing I'd like to say is that uh, the, the visual spatial things, like the clock drawing test, are uh, surprising and 
not arguable. And so a person that uh, has good social skills and have, can have a normal breakfast conversation uh, with, with their family, so the family is unaware of what kind of cognitive impairment they have, and you run through this and you, you show them particularly the, the uh, clock drawing test, they all of a sudden are, it's an awakening to how much cognitive impairment there is. This is true even for the clinician. You can uh, be very, very surprised at somebody that you've had a medical interview with and you think they're pretty, pretty much all together and then you do this and the clock drawing test is a disaster. Uh, so the objectivity of that test can be very good. The, uh, the same thing is, is somewhat, perhaps less dramatically true of the entire test. Uh, a person can have a very normal conversation with you, and then when you ask the questions what day of the week it is, it's Friday when it's actually Monday, uh, what year is it, it's 2006, no, it's 2011, and so forth and so on, uh, there, you really can't argue with the cognitive deficit. When it's the actual life events that are being picked up on, somebody forgot a pot on the stove, somebody did, lost the car keys. You can always come up in a, with an excuse. And sometimes the excuse is just that, it's an excuse. Sometimes, like Freud said, sometimes a cigar is a cigar, and sometimes you really did forget the pot on the stove because you got distracted and there's nothing wrong with your brain. Uh, but the testing has a different objective kind of a meaning and you can't escape the findings of it with uh, excuses in most, in, in most cases. I suppose you could say, well, I didn't sleep last night or something like that, or I drank too much before I took this test. Uh, but otherwise, you're not going to be able to escape the objective reality of, of the testing. Uh, doing this can bring a family... Uh, back to reality so that they can make better choices for their loved one, including uh, things like whether you would go ahead with an extensive operation. Would you do a coronary artery bypass in an individual that scored eight on a St. Louis University medical sta mental status examination? You might think twice about that. The lifespan and the quality of life are just not going to be there to make that kind of expense and danger worth doing. Uh, placement in assisted living in a nursing home, or if the family does intend to have them home, and maybe you've got an adult protective services case where the family is leaving them alone. They go off and go to work. Mom doesn't need anybody there. She's fine. The test doesn't say she's fine. It says somebody's got to be with her 24-7 or else the aluminum siding salesmen are going to get her for a whole bunch of money or she's going to make a mistake and burn up the house or whatever. Something bad is going to happen. Um, it's amazing what kind of denial people can get into uh, if the uh, pressures of economics and family dynamics are what are driving the decision. Sometimes you need something like the cognitive testing to bring it on home. And um, maybe even uh, if they still are in denial, bring it on home to a judge. In practical uh, everyday life, many times I relegate the, the actual performance of these examinations to ancillary staff. Uh, to the nursing staff, uh, or many, many times in my nursing homes, it'll be the social worker that gets to do this. Uh, now, that can create a, a bit of an issue when the social worker does the test, there are impairments there, and either the resident or the family wants feedback. And so what do you do? Uh, I think probably the best thing is to... to um, cop out on that and say, look, I'm not your doc. I really can't put this in the context of the medicines you're on and uh, your age and all of the other things that, that help to determine what this means. I think this will be better discussed with your physician. 
uh, and we think you'll have an opportunity to do that next Friday at 3 o'clock when he comes by or whatever you can offer them to, in a way of a, of a time frame. Um, to, uh, to get sucked into it uh, prematurely could um, just put you on the hot seat uh, when it needs more clinical uh, massaging before. A good example of this would be somebody that performs poorly on the St. Louis University mental status examination and also poorly on the geriatric depression scale. Is that dementia or MCI? Or did the person's uh, cognitive performance suffer because of their depression? That's what we call pseudo-dementia. And that's one for the attending doc. The uh, new MDS 3.0 actually has a standardized test of cognition built into it. Uh, it is not as multidimensional as the St. Louis University Mental Status Exam or the Mini Mental Status Exam that you're familiar with, perhaps, uh, but it's useful. In either case, uh, I'd like to see these uh, examinations done more routinely. And so, as a nurse, as a social worker, uh, someone other than a physician doing these, um, first of all, I like see you advocate for you doing them more routinely in your, in your facility. That gives you another cop-out because you can say, we do these on everybody. We're not looking into some concern we have for you. Uh, alternatively, if there are concerns there, you may feel comfortable in uh, uh, saying, there are some abnormalities here, so there are some things that indicate that there could be a problem, but I think that's, this, this is going to need further explanation. Uh, it's going to need the attention of your physician uh, to carry this forward to see what it really means.